Uh, Judges 17 in your Bible this morning. And, uh, I'm going to preach from a familiar text to you. Uh, you said, I don't have a familiar text in Judges chapter 17. Sure you do. And uh, you'll find that out in a, in a minute. And uh, Judges chapter 17, we're going to look at uh, at least a half dozen verses there. We're going to look at one verse at the end of the book. I think it's chapter 21. And, um, and then we're going to go on from there as we, uh, we look at the topic together. Uh, the thing of it is, what we want you to do, and I understand that we're going we're gonna to remind you, these are God's people uh, that we're talking about out of Judges 17. Okay? Okay? God's people. And now, I understand, and so you're God's people too, but we're in a different time and place, and I understand that we have the risen Christ, Holy Spirit dwells us, we have the written word of God, we have church, you have a pastor, uh, a, there's a congregation, an assembly, um, and things are somewhat different, but we're still God's people, they were God's people, and so uh, the issue today is addressed to God's people. And the statement that's made that we're going to think about today was made about God's people, not unsaved people, not unbelievers. Well, maybe they were unbelievers, but yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't believe a whole lot about with God. But, but so, so you want to, there's, so there's a connection, even though it's different and we're in a different time, uh, about God's people I want you to think about uh, three different things this morning as we get into the sermon. Uh, but anyway, Judges 17, Lord, thank you for you. Uh, thank you for this time together now in your word. Uh, we're grateful we have uh, your word before us as in what we uh, talk about uh, contained in the Bible. Uh, we pray you help us be readers of your word. I pray all the time, Lord, help us not to be so concerned about how much we read, but that we do. We make it a habit. And uh, <clears throat> that for those things we need to know, Help us to remember those things we need to work into our lives. We pray you help us by your power and grace to do that. We pray that uh, those things that would be helpful as we uh, talk to others about the Lord and about life and what situations are and, and what needs are and what God can do, that, that these things that we, we are encouraged about and learn about in the Word of God, that we would remember and actually share them with others uh, so they can be encouraged in the God who's created all things and provided salvation through Christ for eternal life. But we'd ask your blessing what takes place. Help us to be attentive and receptive to what you have for us today from your word. And Holy Spirit, help us all as we, as we now listen, help us to learn. Take it to heart as the need may be. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. So we're in Judges chapter 17. Uh, we're going to read the first uh, uh, six verses, the first six verses. I want to remind you, too, before we read that we're talking about the time of the judges. The time of the judges. You've got Moses and the Israelites, you know, they're released. Uh, Moses went to Egypt, told Pharaoh, let God's people go. He said no, and you had the ten plagues, and eventually they're out of Egypt after 430 years. You got Moses leads them to the promised land, the edge of the promised land, not once, because they're stubborn, not once. Okay, once they got there, but they didn't get in. You know, they got complaining and said, we can't do this, you know. And so anyway, they spent 38 years in the wilderness. The generation died off. He led them again the second time, the next generation to the edge of the promised land, but couldn't get in because God said, you didn't honor me before the people like you should have at a particular time of a need in the wilderness with water. And so then Joshua actually led them into the promised land. Then you've got the book of Joshua in that time frame, and then you've got almost 400 years now after Joshua, the time what we call the judges before you get into the kings of Israel, the first king, uh, Saul. Okay, so it's an extended period of time. We have a tendency to think the time of the judges, it went pretty quick and it wasn't that long, you know, and then they wound up with a king and all that kind of thing. But that's not the case. Now, during the time of the judges, it says there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spake of also in mine ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it or I stole it. 
Okay? I took it. And his mother said, because he's her son, she said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, he gave it back, which was nice of him, wasn't it? Okay? His mother said, I wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a, not to make an offering to the deacon's offering, or make an offering, a tithe offering, you know, for the church budget. She said, I wholly dedicated this, this silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a what? A graven image, an idol, and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee, so you'll have the money to make an idol. But notice she talks like she's on board with God, but wants him to make a graven image, an idol for her. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave, it, gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods. Gods. Cameron talked about this uh, Bible study uh, uh, a time or two. I can't remember what if it was fall or, uh, or spring. He had a house of gods. He had a, he had a shrine, kind of like a shrine, small place to worship, you know. Uh, he had a house of gods. Gods, plural. More than one. Not of the same God, of different gods. And he made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. But listen, you know what the problem is? Verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Pretty obvious. And then what you have, you have, if you would read on, if you would read on, chapter 18, 19, 20, and 21, uh, you have more historical writings of the Israelites and what they were like and what transpired toward, toward, during the time of the judges. And not to be too harsh in judging them, but, you know, for the most part, it wasn't very good. And eventually there would be backsliding, you know, and they're in bondage uh, to their enemies and God would raise a judge and they'd get delivered for a while and they would kind of like serve the Lord and things are good to the judges gone and then they start backslide. Next thing you know, they're in bondage again and they're, they're in trouble. And this, is, and this thing repeats itself often. And a lot of things they did you would wonder about and said, how can these people be the people of God and what they do and what they think and how they are and how they how they talk? They almost sound okay sometimes about God's stuff, but then they're off the wall with idols and graven images. But you have more historical writings of all these things taking place. And, and the end of the book of Judges, once again, reiterates, you know, emphasizes... In those days, there's no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Whatever he thought, whatever he wanted, however he perceived things, that's how it went. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, and I, and I can't be along with this, but but first of all, in both instances that, that says that in the book of Judges, okay? No king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It says no king in Israel. No king like those people wanted. But wait a minute. There was a king. Maybe they didn't address him as king, but they addressed him as Lord. Talking about the Lord. And if you read about uh, uh, how, how it was, God designed, and I don't know how it would have worked out in the end or how it would unfold, but God designed, you know, they had no king over them, but the Lord was over them. And they were to follow him and honor him and worship and serve him. 
And the priesthood was pretty prominent back then and very important because it solved a lot of the issues and gave guidance and moral clarity and supposed to give honest religious instruction for the people, society, and their civic duties. See, there was a king over them, but he wasn't the type of king that they longed for. They wanted a king like the other nations around them. Now, in case you, you think, well, that seemed odd, how can that be? But that's how God designed this. Listen, it came to pass, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, it came to pass when Samuel was old. Samuel the prophet, priest. When Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, the name of the firstborn was Joel. The name of the second was Abiah. Uh, they were uh, judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways. In other words, they didn't follow the Lord, his sons, but he made them judges anyway, but turned after lucre. In other words, they were in it for the money, bribery, and what they could get in riches. They turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment because they took the bribe. Uh, nothing's new. Same thing happened today, so... Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and Ram and said unto them, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Then verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me that I should reign over them. So they had a king, but they didn't want that type of king. They wanted a king like the rest of the nations around them. And consequently, that, uh, because the people did not get what they wanted, they wanted a king. Eventually, they wound up with a king, but, but they wanted a king for a long time because they didn't get what they wanted initially, and they refused God's offer. Okay? As things unfolded and things degenerated in Israel, everybody did whatever seemed right for them. And I'll tell you, if you read the book of Judges... It'll inspire you and discourage you, and sometimes you'll just shake your head, and it's not good. It was, very, it was a very rocky, relentlessly difficult, and exhausting way of life for most of those 400 years under the judges. Their lives were often lived in ways that promoted, listen to me, individualism. Everybody did what they wanted to do, what they thought. It was okay. Hey, that's what I'm going to do. It promoted individualism, a little bit of tribalism, but it lacked a cohesive community of, of if we would say, church or, or the, the religious structure and what was supposed to be and how worship was to be as a nation then, then personally down to the people through the priest. It lacked a cohesive community of church, if I could say it that way, and civic duties that would have been pleasing and honoring to God, and that would have continued to help them live their lives in a way and in a fashion that God designed. And I think they struggled with some of the issues that we struggle with today. I'm going to share them with you. Uh, some of the thought of this that stirred this comes from this. So you understand and you could read it for yourself. It's, it's, about, it's about the effect that, that media has on you. And technology with the media, uh, the effect it has on us in the day and age in which we live. It's entitled Three Ways uh, Social Media Has Changed Our Priorities and perspectives. It's from coldcasechristianity.com, where I, I got a couple of the ideas, just so you know. And you could take a look at that for yourself and read it if you'd like. But these people that, that decided they're going to do whatever seems right in their own eyes, 
They struggle with some of the things we struggle with today. And if you think about this, in a, in a very real sense, if you, if you know the history back then, they, they walked away from objective truth. In other words, objective truth is, you know where you get that from? Now, I, I understand I'm not talking about sciences or about history for right now, okay? All right? I'm talking about spiritual things that directly relate to your life, my life, and how we live and how we are and what we think and how we present ourselves and about what our hope is for the next life and about eternity and all those kind of things. Listen, they walked away from objective truth. And, and what they did, you can find out from the statement, listen, they embraced personal beliefs as their own truth. Their own truth. Now, where you get objective truth when you think about this, you're thinking about God and his word. Because what God says is so. What God says is reality. What God says has been settled in heaven forever. You know, and that goes then what it what God says actually is enforced here on earth. The same as it is in heaven. And so God, you can always count on God that he will be truthful with you. And that's where you that's where you uh, settle yourself and build, have your foundation built. And then you grow from there. They walked away from objective truth. They walked away from God again. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. They didn't want to hear about the truth of God. And let alone that, they didn't want to go ahead and live it in their lives. Because when you have truth, I'm getting ahead of myself and I'm not angry. Okay, I'm just staying awake. Okay, because I lost an hour of sleep too. Anyway, so listen, so so they, what they're doing, they're, they're walking away from it and uh, they don't want to hear it. They decide about it. It's for themselves. They're going to decide what their own beliefs are. And that'll make my truth versus your truth. That's how it's going to be. And I'll tell you what, every time you're confronted, though, with the truth of God, in whatever realm it might be, you have to do something with it. You got to do something with it. Because God's truth is very different than anything else we would claim as being true. They walked away from the objective truth of God to embrace their own personal beliefs as their own truth. That's what they're going to live by because they did whatever they wanted in their own eyes, whatever they decided what they were going to believe and how it's going to be. That's how they decided. That's what they're going to do. The prophets in their preaching and their teaching of the facts of the truth of God in those people's minds were just another another opinion that their particular religion had. The other religions had their beliefs, their opinions. You got your truth, and I got mine. But we know about Jesus. We know about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. The way. Singular. The way. Not only did he say that, you know, he's, he's going to add to it and heighten your anxiety and raise your blood pressure. He said, I'm the way. And then he said, I am the truth. And not only that, he added to that, he said, I am the life. I've told you this before, and it's not that I'm complaining. It's just that it, it, uh, it concerns me. Sometimes it grieves me. If I was younger, sometimes I'd smack a few people, but I know better now. You know, I'm an old man. I got to conserve energy and emotion. You know, I tried to conserve my hair, but that didn't work. But, you know, you know, you know how many times that I've shared God's Objective truth. This is what God says. Yeah. But I think. Dun, 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 dun. And because I'm part Italian, I go, ay, 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 ay. You know, it's like, 
I just told you and explained to you, actually explained to you what God says. Here's the truth. And you say, yeah, but I think this. They usually don't say it's my opinion. They say, or I believe this. Even Christians that don't want to be bothered with certain truths of God because they're kind of like half into this thing, you know, doing whatever's right in their own eyes to point. Because I'll tell you what you think or what your opinion is, that's where you're going to wind up believing what you're believing. And you're going to believe that belief is as important or more important than the truth. And these people are making an excuse to follow what they decided is true. Their belief, their opinion made their belief, made their truth. Although you know this already, and I guess the verse wasn't ready for them yet, but the truth sets you what? Free. The truth doesn't enslave you. The truth sets you free. To follow God, to be saved God's way for heaven, and to follow him in life. Sets you free to do that. You're free to do that. You think it enslaves you. And you think it's hard labor, but it's not. It's hard to walk sometimes and get, stay out of our flesh because we got a sin nature. But the truth of God sets you free, whatever it pertains to. Whether it's you steal that five hours from somebody, or it talks about sexuality or gender identification and life and biology, doesn't matter. Whatever the truth of God's word is, I'll tell you what, you accept that and you believe that and you integrate that in your life Christ said it, it'll set you free, not enslave you, set you free. But like I said before about the truth, the first point's the longest, you understand this, is that, okay, is, is this, that about truth, once you've heard it, there's, there's some kind of way God works this, that, that there's, there's, you, you have to do something with it. You have to do something with it. And for us, even for the people back here in the time of the judges, for us, it may be something that initially we might find offensive to us or intrusive to us. But if we'll take it and receive it and integrate it in our lives, the truth, it will transform our lives. And it'll please God. It will, if I could say it this way, it'll, it'll, I'm going to sound charismatic. It'll put you on blessing ground with God. And it'll be a benefit to others that live around you. It really will. So they struggled with objective truth, the truth of God. And tended to often, repeatedly, have their own opinions, their own beliefs, even of the pagans. They, they took the pagan societies around them, integrated it in their lives. Believed it is truth for them, and that's why they did whatever was right in their own eyes. They struggled with something else. They struggled with something else is this. To be their own final authority. See, if you're going to do whatever is right in your own eyes, you, you, you have decided to be your own final authority. That's right. They tended to, uh, to be their own final authority about what was right or not or what was righteous or not. You understand? And they would distance themselves from or actually dismiss the rightness or the righteousness of God. What he said's right. They said, we don't want God's authority about what's right and what's wrong. 
In our day and age, we ga- people will gasp for breath. Okay? If you say that's right and that's wrong, their head will explode because they become their own authority about what's right. They become their own authority about what they think is moral. And I don't have time because we need to move on. In our day and age, boy, morality about what's moral and what's not moral has certainly changed. And for the most part, what you believe and how you want to live and what you consider sinful or wrong, you are the problem. You are being immoral to this higher morality now, woke disclaims. So these people, and they're, they're God's people, and, and for us, we struggle with this. We like our independence, don't we? Hey, we're Americans. Wasn't there a declaration of independence signed, and did we you know, fight the revolutionary war a long time ago so we could be free and independent? And aren't we independent Baptist? Yikes. You know, but we have to be careful. They struggled with these people back then being their own final authority about what's righteous or what's moral. They distanced God's righteousness, what God said was right and wrong, or sometimes they even just dismissed it, okay, for their own personal, their own personal, what I could say, morality, of what they decided what's right and what's wrong. In other words, they decided what would be acceptable behavior and unacceptable behaviors as a way of life. And that included their attitude, it included their disposition, uh, their mindset, their thought patterns, their actions, their words, what it would look like life in everyday life, they decided that themselves. They decided to be their own authority. And they decided if you're your own authority, then you are your own lawgiver because you are your own lawmaker. And you give yourself a law, whatever you made, deciding what's acceptable and what isn't. And that's what they did. They left God out of the, out of the picture. Dangerous way to live. Because you can be right about some things and really wrong about some other things and get yourself in a world of trouble. And if you told them that that's right, God said so, that's right and that's acceptable and that over there is wrong, that's unacceptable with God, they would say, how dare you? How dare you say that to me? Who do you think you are to push your morality on my, me? I have mine. And for you to claim there's a higher authority than human authority and that we're responsible to this God who is the higher authority and about his righteousness or what's right and wrong, the unchanging, eternal, righteous morality that God presents to say that's exactly, you know, where humans need to look for their right and wrong, their morality in life and God is the one who has determined that for us. Like I said before, their head would explode. His commands, his laws, what he has determined of what's acceptable and unacceptable, what is actually right and wrong, they struggled with because so often they dismissed God became their own authority. And it boils down to this, will there be a humble acceptance of God's morality, even for us as Christians. Because we skirt the corners as believers. Too many churches, Christian churches, skirt the corners about what's moral, what's immoral, what God will accept, what he won't accept. And I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I hear it all the time. You know, about the love thing. The love, love means everything's acceptable. Everything's approved by God. Who told you that? You didn't get that from here, you know. God accept you just as you are. Yeah, God will welcome you just as you are, but you're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove what is good and acceptable unto Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. 
And last, I need to hurry. Listen, I think they struggled with this, with not being selfish about one's own life, because they did what they thought was right in their own eyes. Every person did that. I think they were struggling with being selfish about their own life. You know, we always think about our own life, and we should be concerned about our own lives, and we are accountable to God for our lives, absolutely. But I think they struggle with being selfish about their own life. Listen, when you're selfish, when you're selfish about your own life, you'll have self-righteousness, you'll be self-centered, and you'll, you'll self-appropriate things because you'll, you'll take it, attain it, or do whatever just for yourself, and you'll be self-promoting to the point that it's sickening to others. Their common sense can't take it anymore because it's always about you and not about others. We need to think about. We need to stop. We're going to sing again. So I need to stop, but we need to think about this. They struggle with not being selfish. Because if you do whatever's right in your own eyes, there's no way you can't be selfish. Because most of us have an inclination to put self first. Now, there are some things that we need to take care of self, and you understand that. But they were going way overboard. They didn't care about their neighbor. They didn't care about the household of faith. They didn't care about community. They didn't care about church. They, they cared about themselves because everybody did what was right in their own eyes. We don't want to be selfish, we want to be sharing. Instead of a man doing what is right in his own eyes by claiming no king, no authority over us, he got him in trouble. Every time that was the case. For us, we have a king, the Lord Jesus, don't we? I think we do. Don't we have a king? Sure we do. Aren't we the people of God also? Sure we are. We don't like this sermon, and we don't like what it said about the people of God in the Old Testament, but just a, a caution for us to be careful how we perceive things and how we respond to what God has done for us and what he has for us in this life. I'll close with one verse. You say, good thing you're running over time, Pastor. I know. Uh, you forgive me, and next week we'll, we'll catch up. And uh, listen, only let your conversation or your way of life, how you live your life, be as becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether, uh, Paul said, whether I come and see you, Philippian believers, whether I come and see you or be absent from you, I may hear of your affairs, listen, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, being in agreement, uh, agreement, striving together for the faith of the gospel, let's sing.